Constance from Mysterious Galaxy. Wait, wait, we're, we're circle pending. I think we're, now we're live, now we're live. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, as the spinning circle of death has indicated, we had some mild tech issues on our side, but thus is the way of the virtual world. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon though. I am so excited because as all of you know, Mysterious Galaxy, we love our sci-fi fantasy authors and we have such a donkulously amazing lineup for you guys. You are in for such a treat. Now, due to our delayed start, I am not going to ramble on and give you a long intro. I'm just going to give you the house rules and then throw it off to SB, who is going to give you a more formal introduction of everyone. But as you all know, to the right-hand side, we have our general chat section. Now, if you have any questions for us, make sure you ask, because that's kind of the best part about events, is that you get to ask. You got to pry the author brain and figure out what is going on in that mysterious place. So if you have questions, there will be a ask a question button down below. Make sure you use it. And also you can vote on questions. So if there's one where you're like, this question must be answered, put the ye old thumbs up and it will boost that question up. And then most importantly, during team you are looking for things to do, say, some amazing authors and your local bookstore. If you wish to do so, you can purchase those books, which I highly recommend, no bias whatsoever. Uh oh. Oops. <laughs> uh, continue technical difficulties. Oh, Markety, you're muted. <laughs> I sure am. Uh, <laughs> we'll check off. I, I think that Constance was saying that there's a purchase books link. Yes. Um, at the bottom of the screen, <laughs> and that we all appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll we'll just dive in at this point. Um, hi everyone, good to see you, and uh, welcome to our panel celebrating March book release authors. Um, this whole thing started by somebody on Twitter tagging a few of us as having the same book birthday. Some of those book birthdays ended up shifting for various reasons, but we're very glad to finally come together and be able to chat with you. I am S.B. Divya. I'm an author and editor of science fiction and fantasy, in addition to being an engineer sometimes during the day. Uh, my first novel, Machine Hood, just came out on March Second, <laughs> I feel like I've lived about five lifetimes in five weeks. Um, I'm guessing my fellow uh, recent debuts and uh, published authors can relate. And uh, I'm co-editor of Escape Pod, a weekly science fiction podcast, and very happy to be here. I'm going to let my fellow panelists introduce themselves, and then we're going to have a little bit of a chat about our experiences over these past few weeks. And after about half an hour, we will start to take questions from the audience. So please go ahead as you think of things, put them in the ask a question window, and then I will get to it. So um, Arkady, why don't you start off with uh, the next introduction? All right. I'm Arkady Martin. I am a writer of science fiction and fantasy and sometime a historian of the Byzantine Empire and currently work in energy and climate policy in the state of New Mexico. Um, my book, second book, A Desolation Called Peace, which is the sequel to my first book, A Memory Called Empire, came out on March 2nd as well. Um, and it has definitely been an interesting five weeks. It's been lovely and also overwhelming as one would expect. So hi, great to see all of you. Thank you. Um, CL Clark, why don't you go next? I'm going in order of my screen. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I am CL Clark, or Sheree. You guys can call me Sheree. Um, I am the author of The Unbroken and numerous other short stories in sci fi and fantasy mostly. Um, I also I work for uh, Podcastle. I'm one of the co editors. So, Podcastle and Escape Pod are like their siblings under the escape artists umbrella. Um, and I was not part of the original OG March 2nd. The Unbroken actually came out March 23rd. So I'm very 
glad to be hanging out with these awesome folks. All right, thank you. And Primi, last hi. but definitely not least. <laughs> yeah, hi, I'm uh, Primi Mohammed. Uh, my Escape Pod connection is that I'm an associate editor at Escape Pod, so I'm one of the first readers that gets to look at people's lovely stories. Please keep sending them in. Um, and uh, I also work uh, in land policy for the uh, government of Alberta. And when I am not doing that, I am writing my sequel to my debut novel came out. It was supposed to be, I think, March uh, 2nd uh, for one set of jurisdictions and like six for another. And then it got moved to March 30th and April first but actually people have been getting the books for like several weeks so that's one thing about publishing is i didn't really get a launch day or like a book release day i've had like a book release month because it's just been trickling into people's hands but um, yeah it's uh that's my second book out for the year the first one uh was these lifeless things which came out in february cool. that's amazing <laughs> three books There's still in. two more to go in one pandemic year. Oh, two more this year? Yeah, two more this year. One in wow. June and one in September. Oh. For me, how do you find time to write all these books in the middle of a pandemic? I have stopped <laughs> sleeping. <laughs> okay, yeah, that makes that sense. Was, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll throw out the, the fun softball question, which is, um, what have been some of the best moments of your book releases in these last few weeks or some some favorite events or particular treats that you did for yourself highlights uh, from the whole experience my publisher sent me cupcakes <gasps> Yay, the week before last <laughs> that was super exciting they had little uh books on them not just like the book cover on like a piece of chocolate but like a little book with a book cover oh. around it so that was really nice <laughs> it's awesome cake cake is a big was a big part of uh of my book launch as well because i my my editor sent me a cake and um i also bought a cake to decorate myself i was intending to bake and do a very elaborate cake but um i actually came down with covid at the end of january so i was still mm -hmm. recovering when my book came out enough that I was not up to my usual level of baking and fondant and fancy stuff. So I, I limited myself and just bought a good cake. So I ended up with two cakes, which was pretty great, actually. It made me feel a lot better about debuting in the middle of all this. <laughs> yeah. You do, this is like off topic, but already, oh my God. Um, That's okay. You do uh, cake decoration. I do chocolates. Ooh. We should talk about that. We time. should. I actually did. Can I just be there? I just want to be there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Next time we'll get together <laughs> in person. <laughs> what kind um, of chocolate? Did you make chocolate for your book release? Yeah, I do. Um, so I got into like doing amateur chocolatier stuff. So filled molded chocolate. Um, and then I had to relearn how to do it because I moved to New Mexico and I live at 7,000 feet in the air. Oh. And this actually changes tempering temperatures, which is not something I had counted on and was unpleasant the first time I tried it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I did custom like Tixkalan chocolates for my book launch of book one, but it's hard to do chocolates in a pandemic, so. <laughs> Yeah, there's not as many people to share with. I ended up getting two. Well, the, the cake they sent me and the one I bought were both fairly small because I was like, I don't have, you know, 30 friends to invite over to share a giant cake with me. <laughs> How about you, Shrey? Um, So <laughs> I am similarly isolated. Like we're, I'm in London right now and I'm, I'm in lockdown. And so I have some friends here um actually one of my best friends um from kansas lives here as well um but i'm away from family away from friends and so everybody just mailed me champagne <laughs> which is amazing but like you said i like it's me and my partner here so that we're like even as excited as we were we could only drink so much of <laughs> um so now we just have uh bottles to pop gradually you know um 
that's, that's not a bad problem to have, you know, no, no, cake, not at all. Champ champagne keeps, um, chocolate keeps, of course, too. Like you could make lots of chocolate and, and it would survive. I've heard that's like one of the best things to have on hand in case of disasters, nuclear winters, earthquakes, whatever, like chocolate is, uh, it's good for you. It's high calorie and it basically survives everything. <laughs> High temperatures, low temperatures, you can always eat chocolate. Um, clearly, I'm a fan. And yes, Arkady, we have to talk after because <laughs> I've always wanted to like get into chocolatering too, but there's only so many hours um, in a day and or a month to do all of our fun, fun hobbies. <laughs> I had a, I opened a 10 year old um, Imperial Stout to go with my chocolate cake for. Mm. Uh, book launch day yes that was um, that was good i figured i had to have some kind of alcohol something to wash it while down. <laughs> yeah well like goes really well with chocolate cake <laughs> um what about uh like events and stuff because i have i didn't i felt like the week of i had um i had one really fun in conversation with malka older the day before mm -hmm. and then it was really mostly a lot of like podcast interviews and things that were asynchronous, not necessarily um, live. So it's kind of been this odd mixture of this kind of thing occasionally. And then just a lot of like back channel promotion, talking to various people. And I really, the one good experience I had in person um, was for an event at Blizzard, except that I wasn't at Blizzard. But in advance, I went to a bookstore nearby that was hosting it. And I got to sign books at their bookstore because it was like an hour away. And it was really fun because I was sitting outside at the little folding table and somebody walked past to go to a pharmacy and actually saw me and was like, oh, what's this? I'm like, this is my science fiction book. Oh, I just held it up to my show and tell. This is my science fiction book about artificial intelligence. It's my first novel. And she came over and, and ended up buying a book <laughs> that I got to sign for her. And I was like, Finally, I got to find something <laughs> and like interact with a human being for this whole. Like, I miss that so much. Um, awesome. I don't know if anyone else has had uh, any sort of local experience. I'm um, really excited or, because our our like non-essential shops are supposed to open up um, on Monday. I think so. That includes bookstores, and so there's a a big fantasy bookstore that I'd like to go to uh, for Forbidden Planet. Wait, oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. 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 And um so I would like to go and just like see it if they've got it in like displayed yet or like on shelves or something which would be just uh just I just want to see it. <laughs> but in the meantime I've had some some fan art which has been pretty cool like just That's to see so somebody get really excited about a character and make a rendition of them just like the way they want to and or fan venn diagrams with Arcade. <laughs> um. i found that on tumblr <laughs> and like i used to be on tumblr like ages and ages ago and every so often someone who used to know me on tumblr sends me something that they found and i got that one i was like oh my god yes it is the <laughs> common problem between a memory called empire and the trader better cormorant everyone has too much email <laughs> It just made my day. <laughs> but I miss talking to people. I did get to go to my local indie, um, which is in Santa Fe, called Collected Works, and sign some books for them. But there weren't any people there. It was just me and, like, mm -hmm. the staff, which was lovely, but not the same thing at all. Primi, have you gotten out of the house for anything book related? I'm one of those uh, so-called high risk people. So I leave the house about once every two months, like, and I live alone. So on the one hand, you'd think, oh, like, this is great for a writer and a hermit, but I <laughs> this is getting a little old. So yeah, no, there haven't been any in-person events. I had one for my debut last year, which was literally March 14th, like right before everything absolutely locked down and uh that was the only in-person thing that i've gotten to do for any of my books 
Was that good at least last year? I mean, like, yeah, to, it was really kind nice. of cap yeah. off the start of this whole pandemic. Yeah, no, the, the staff brought like stacks of books to sign. So I was sitting there, my friends are taking pictures of me signing them, and somebody brought cupcakes, and um, like a couple of people from work showed up, and I was like, no, 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 no. I don't want to <laughs> It's but it was really held at, at the bookstore, like three blocks from my work. So when people were asking me where I was going at the end of the day, I couldn't really lie. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it was nice you. to see like people and have them be like excited for the book. And yeah, to see it on the shelves too, because I got to see that for the first one. And I haven't obviously got to see that for the second one. In fact, for the first one, um, like the week before it was supposed to be out, I was walking past this bookstore to go to the grocery store to get a sandwich for lunch, and there were a bunch in the window. I just stopped, like, Ooh, that's that supposed so cool. to be <laughs> like, is that supposed to be happening? I ducked <laughs> in, took a photo, and left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I ended up uh, driving up to. A Barnes and Noble about 30 miles away because they were the only ones who had my book in stock and with the mask and everything it just like took the the shelfie because I'm like I want to see my book out in the wild once it's there and then I signed their copies and they only had like three but it was it was still something I'm still waiting to um to get to my libraries our libraries are still closed except for curbside pickup mm -hmm. books on hold mm -hmm. and so I'm like I would like to go do that in the library at some point too. I think that would be cool. My mom just called me to tell me she's been calling the libraries to make sure they have it. <laughs> That's incredibly sweet. And also I deeply sympathize with that particular sort of parental relationship. <laughs> and do they have them, Shrey? As a matter of fact, well, so the way she phrased it, she's like, well, I called them because I was going to donate. I bought some and I was going to donate it to them. And I was like, you know, they have a butt, like they, that's, they buy books, like that's what they do. And she's like, no, 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 I was just gonna donate them. And, but they already had four of them. <laughs> I was like, okay, cool. I don't know if this is like for the whole Kansas City library system or, or like just one library, but yes. So my mom's doing some good legwork. Yes, mine are almost all checked out at this point. I'm totally not stalking my library, but I am. Um, <laughs> this is like for the entire county system. I went on there. I went on there to see, like, you know, like, can I, is there any way I could get? And I was like, maybe I should put it on hold so I can go. And then I was like, they're all gone, <laughs> which is kind of cool. I'm happy about that. <laughs> yeah, my library app keeps recommending that I borrow it, and I'm like, I wrote it can you take that off my recommendations <laughs> amazon cannot, does that apparently. To me. yeah amazon does that too <laughs> would you like to read the book you wrote no, no, I don't wrote no not, not right now <laughs> yeah i'm no, sure I had you to read all it 57 read times for yeah exactly yeah <laughs> Yeah, I think that was the hardest thing for me last summer was reading my page proofs and copy edits because there are references to pandemics in this book. Like part of the plot um, is that, you know, people take these daily pills to take care of whatever the latest pathogen is that's circulating. And so um, when those perhaps stop for nefarious reasons <laughs> suddenly everyone's like oh no they're getting sick again and i was like did i have to write this and like <laughs> i have to do this now um, so aside from the the not in person um any other low lights you feel like sharing from from these last few weeks zoom fatigue I mean, I guess like the only thing that happened to me was that I would wish had gone differently was that because of the pandemic, the release date for Desolation was actually moved because I was originally supposed to be like a late fall, early winter 2020 book. But a lot of people who were spring 2020 got moved to fall 2020. So mm -hmm. the whole sequence moved publishing. Um, <laughs> So I originally thought that I'd have a relatively open work schedule 
during launch. And it turned oh. out I had the exact opposite of that because I do policy analysis for the legislative session, which is only 60 days a year. And those 60 days included March 2nd um, and the two weeks following. So doing that and the launch at the same time was really hard. Um, but that's not as much about like this pandemic. In a way, the pandemic made it possible because I could do everything virtually. I wouldn't have been mm -hmm. able to take off time if that had gone the other way. Yeah, same. I think um, the shift to, to digital to virtual has been a lifesaver in some ways because I've been traveling so much. There are things that I am willing to stay up late for, like so, that I might not be able to do otherwise. Like I, I certainly couldn't get to California. Like I couldn't make that flight um, otherwise. So it's, on, on that note, it's been pretty, not like the pandemic's not good, but you know. <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> the virtual, the virtual thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the virtual thing has been nice from that standpoint to be able to hang out with people that I wouldn't normally have been able to pull in for this kind of thing. Um, even for, yeah, even for being able to chat with Malka. It's funny with Malka older, like I have been in a, you know, fan of Infomocracy since it came out and I've never crossed paths with her at any convention, anything. And so, she our, so great. She, yeah. And so finally I reached out to her and said, you know, would you be willing to do like some in conversation event with me? And, um, and that's when we finally got to actually like sit down and talk and I obviously face to face virtually, but I'm like, at this point I will, I will take it. Of course, she's also in Europe now. So that makes it, that makes it tougher. Um, our, uh, assuming you've all heard of that, Worldcon this year or Discon mm -hmm. in Washington DC it has shifted their date to December. Mm -hmm. um, are any of you planning to to attend, assuming that you know things go well pandemic wise <laughs> and we don't actually get people yeah, that vaccinated? Is really we don't have, you know, yeah, physically, like, physically probably not. Physically probably not. Yeah, same and, here. And tickets are so expensive in late December anyway. I just I hate to think that you know, I even if I could scrape up the cash to go, that they would be deliberately trying to get double the money out of me just because it's at that time of the year. Do you have any flight credit you could maybe apply left over from canceled things last year? Mm, yeah, I was planning on using that to uh, for other stuff, but maybe, I don't know. I, I Nothing's been booked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Our I fear. was... I was thinking about it um, when it was still sort of like a maybe September or November date, because that I could probably swing, but I'm not sure I can do December because I do want to see my family for the winter holidays. And that's, I don't think I can do two East Coast trips in the same month, like financially, <laughs> but I'll probably participate virtually just for the, the, I don't know. I, I feel like with Worldcon, it can be such a old guard show if people who aren't in the old guard don't volunteer to participate on the panels. So I'll probably volunteer to do like one or two virtually, but I don't think I'm gonna go. I'm hoping to go. I'm still a little leery of making any kind of plans. Um, just the way things are going, I'm like, what if it mutates? What if it comes back? <laughs> like, I feel like nobody really knows what's going to happen. But um, yeah, I was going to try to go and, and maybe bring family and actually stay for the holidays since my daughter will be off school right around that time. And uh and take her around DC because she's never been. And I think it's, it's such a such a lovely place and so much good museums, good history, all of that stuff. But yeah, there's a lot to do around there. So even if she's bored of Worldcon, she can she can have other fun things that we can do together. <laughs> but yeah, I still have uh, leftover flight credit from last March, we were supposed to go on the, the Joko cruise. I don't know if you've heard of that, AKA the nerd cruise for the first time 
Um, and it was, uh, was going to be our first cruise too, because we're not really cruise people, my spouse and I. And uh, it was, it was the second week of March, and so we agonized and went back and forth, and then finally decided uh, not to go. <laughs> but it's like every, you know, of course, everything that was booked had to be unbooked. Yeah, the same thing happened uh, to me. My publisher actually offered me uh, some money and had booked some dates in the UK for kind of a little like, not a book tour, but like a little signing tour in a couple places in the UK and uh, yeah, at the Forbidden Planet and at some Waterstones in various cities. And I was going to go and make like a little tour of it and write it off because I was signing books. <laughs> and yeah, I canceled that at the absolute last minute. And I was really kind of sad about that because you know there were people I wanted to visit and friends I wanted to see and family and the book things and then of course the months-long nightmare of being like hey um so there would there's a plague can I have my money back and companies <laughs> going <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You. that's that's oh. our money now so I think almost all of it's been recouped by this point though oh that's good cool <laughs> It's sad though, because I was like, "Oh, it's my debut book. You only debut once. They you, they probably would not have even offered me this, you know, money to offset hotel costs and stuff." And uh, that'll probably never happen again. Oh well. <laughs> yeah, you right? never know. Maybe you you'll never be, know. You'll be like super famous bestseller uh, after your three books come out or four books come out this year. Four or this year. <laughs> yeah. See. Or I'll be dead. <laughs> No, uh, <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see. Hey, hey publishers, if you're listening. <laughs> That's right. Look, she can write four books a year. <laughs> Minting money. Um, so, so far. Uh, I'm like, book. oh, are you? I'm like, do we? Oh, good. Do I, we have some do? Questions. I have some questions. I have some questions. Yeah, I was going to say, before we get into how are you managing to write, let me um, let me take Mysterious Galaxy's very fair prompt, which is that we are four different authors with potentially four very different audiences who may not be familiar with the books that we're discussing. So, um, Primi, since you were talking and you've got so many, why don't you give us like a quick rundown of these awesome books that are out and coming out this year? Okay, um, I guess These Lifeless Things is a standalone, although the short story that it's sort of based on came out in the Sock Dellager in 2017. And it's uh, about the end of the world, because uh, these things sometimes happen, but also about uh, people studying the end of the world and uh, what that looks like after what you'd consider to be the end. What kind of rebuilding is there? Um, A Broken Darkness, as mentioned, is the sequel to uh, 2020's Beneath the Rising. <laughs> Sorry, I have to keep this stack next year because I do so many events in here, um, which is about a uh, prodigy scientist who solves the world's energy problem and creates a bunch more problems. Uh, and the sequel is kind of, uh, dealing with the uh, fallout of a world that's had to deal with the first book and is having some trust and paranoia problems. Uh, the third book that's coming out is um, with Neon Hemlock and it's a novella called And What Can We Offer You Tonight, uh, which will be about um, a society in which you literally have to work to live and what happens uh, <clears throat> when that system kind of falls apart. So mm -hmm. kind of capitalism on steroids. And the final one is called um, uh, the Annual Migration of Clouds, which is with ECW Press, uh, that's coming out in September, and is, I guess, what we're calling climate fiction. So it's kind of a post-collapse book about a uh, community that's trying to rebuild itself out of the ashes, uh, right here in Edmonton, actually. That's amazing. I'm Congratulations. So Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Arkady, why don't you why don't you go next? Give us a rundown of your two books. So um, the two books. This is the second one, which I just I love the cover so much. I got incredibly lucky with covers on both of mine. Um, and so a memory called Empire and a Desolation called Peace are parts one and two of a duology. Um, so. Yes, it is a duology. There are two books that go in a set. There might be more Tixkalan, but these two are a unit. Uh, and they are, I guess, space opera. They're really political science fiction in a very far future 
scenario with a lot of politics, imperialism, assimilation, aliens, there's a war. Uh, and uh, my my old publicist who I worked with when I the first book came out, I uh, used to call them House of Cards in Space, which I still think is a really good way of like doing the one line of what they're like. And I guess I'm right now I, I envy Premi enormously at finishing things. Uh, I'm working on a novella, which is a locked room AI mystery um, in a desert. And that's near future. It's the first time I've done near future in long form and it's terrifying. <laughs> so yeah, that's what I'm working on now. Sheree? Um, I am, yes, I am the author of The Unbroken. This is, uh, this bad boy is very chunky. Uh, this is, I think one of the, like, the US or the UK, one of them is bigger than the other one. Um, so I try to, you know, trick people into thinking they're getting like a mm, bigger book. But um, featuring Terrain's arms, we know them, we love them. It is um, another sort of anti-colonial, imperial um sort of critique follows terrain um who is a conscripted soldier in an imperial army and luca who is the imperial princess and what they do when they go to a colony that just so happens to be the colony that terrain was taken from um and they try to crush a rebellion and obviously like shit hits the fan and does not go as planned um, but I think it hits a lot of similar conversation points as um, a memory called Empire with like assimilation and like what it means to be raised to venerate the empire and then what happens when you actually have to like see who you are in that empire. Um, and um, what am I working on book two? Well, technically my editor has book two, so I'm just thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best place uh, to be. Yeah. Um, we're talking about titles, which I saw a question asking you, Arkady, about your awesome titles. So would love some wisdom um, about that later, either on chat or off chat, like whichever. <laughs> the titles are a uh, funny story, actually, if you all want to hear it. Yeah, okay. go for it. Yeah. Yeah. So I did not have a title for A Memory Called Empire at all while I was writing it. Like it was, I had like, it was titled The Perils of Mahit, like a pulp story because I did not know what to call it. And I continued to not know what to call it to the point where I was submitting it to agents to try to get an agent. So I basically came up with, I think it was called Mahit and the City briefly. And then I think I sold it under that or it might've been, um, this imperfect world or something like that. Uh, anyway, some kind of title I pulled out of my ass. Um, and then when my agent sold it, it was sold under another placeholder terrible title. And then I spent like three months throwing water balloons at Castle Tour Marketing um, of titles. I had no idea what this book was gonna be called. I actually found the title to Desolation First. Um, Cause that one comes from a quotation uh, from Tacitus. It's from uh, this bit of the Agricola where uh, one of the characters is talking about what Rome does. Rome makes a desert and calls it peace. Uh, and I've always loved that. And the words for desert and desolation are very close in Latin. They're even closer in Greek. And I was just thinking about it. It was like, oh, that would be a really good title for book two. I was like halfway through writing book two at the time. Uh, and asked my editor, yeah, could I have that one? Is this one okay? <laughs> and she was really enthused and then asked me to like back form the title for A Memory Called Empire out of it, like make it similar. So that's how. I'm actually kind of bad at titles. <laughs> I'm playing well, the water out. balloon game right now. So, um. <laughs> yeah, I think all of my, uh, or I should say all, my novella and my novel both went through multiple titles in their lifetimes. And that, that brainstorming of just like 
barfing out 20 or 30 things, eventually something surfaces that's halfway decent. <laughs> yeah, that's why I, I sometimes will go on Twitter and ask if anybody wants a title for my terrible novel title generator. It's just a spreadsheet I built a couple of years ago with a randomizer. So every minute or so, it randomly creates a new title. And okay, I so, that. yeah, and uh, it's terrible because I just threw in about 120 words related to sci fi and fantasy, and I didn't separate them or anything. So, about half the titles you'll end up with something like the knight and the wizard and the spaceship, and you're like, okay, X <laughs> or the Taurus Taurus. Okay, I'm not calling this book the Taurus Taurus. Come up with something else. I can wait the 60 seconds. <laughs> but literally for a broken darkness, that's I, I came up with like five titles or something and threw them at my editor, and I was like, "This is your problem now. You pick a title." So we did. <laughs> Creamy, I'm gonna take a note because you just inspired me to finally um, install GPT three, the uh, the natural language AI, <laughs> and and turn it into a title generator for all. Let's do it. Yeah, ours. it it's can't like, be worse than what we come wrong. up with on our own. No, I'm sure it's not. Um, all right, so I, I realized I haven't gone with my own book. Uh, so Machine Hood is my first novel, and it is my AI story, basically. It is near future, set in 2095. It's something of a political thriller that touches on the gig economy, privacy, data, artificial intelligence, labor rights, machine rights. And the main character is an ex-special forces turned private security who's about to retire and start her slow fast food movement when she gets drawn back in through some unusually violent events for this world uh, by a shadowy organization that's calling themselves the machine hood and is demanding that humanity stop taking these protective pills that allows them to compete and work alongside the intelligent machines of the future and instead liberate the robots and the AIs and give them rights. So that's that book. And then last year I managed to write a whole new book that's very, very different. So this, so speaking to your uh, struggles with near future Arcady, I love writing near future science fiction, but in the middle of the pandemic, especially the early part of the pandemic, when I was sitting down to um, to draft something new, I just did not want to deal with reality. So I went the opposite. And so I did a far future space opera thing <laughs> so that I could escape all of today's problems and, uh, and just kind of disappear into a, a very different world and a very different set of, of issues. Um, so that's how I was coping. So yes, when, when my edits occasionally came back for this book, it was sometimes a bit of a struggle to, to switch gears and, and become relevant to present day circumstances and news all over again. I have a question about that a little bit. So when you were doing that, do you have a near future book? Did you alter anything in edits to kind of like hint at now? Because I know people writing near future books didn't know that it was happening. So like Chuck Wendig's The Wanderers came out and I was reading it in March and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> no, I, I, like I said, I accidentally already had pandemics figured in because when I was doing the research for it, which was back in like three years, four years ago now, right? Spring of mm -hmm. 2017, I was reading some global forecast foresight type stuff. And um, they were saying that thanks to climate change, we are probably going to be facing more pandemics, you know, in the next few decades. So that was already built into my, you know, history between now and 2095. <laughs> so I didn't have so to cool. change anything, but it was still, it was still a little painful to, um, to be right about that. <laughs> yeah, for, so, um, oh, oh sorry, go on. Oh, I was just gonna say, for when I was doing the edits um, just a couple of weeks ago, actually, for um, the last book I have coming out this year, uh, which does center um, a, a pandemic disease, a global pandemic disease. So I accidentally wrote a plague novel back in like 2019 and didn't get published till now. But um, there was a little list of the um, previous plagues that had come before. And it was something like uh, something blah, 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 I Ebola, Zika. And the editor had popped in a little note saying, do you want to add Corona? And I was like, <laughs> 
I mean, I will, <laughs> but I'm not happy about it <laughs> because now I have to put this plague into my plague book. But it was so weird just kind of sitting there and thinking about it. Like everything seemed to change so fast. Like mm -hmm. one month there was this coronavirus we had never heard of. And then the next month the entire world was locking down. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's always the, the peril of writing <laughs> your future. Your future, yeah. Reality See, I just hang out in you. fantasy it's and it's all <laughs> no predictions, though I like if you've read The Unbroken, you know that people are talking about a plague that happened. I'm not gonna say anything. <laughs> <laughs> no spoilers. <laughs> plagues are gonna plague, yeah. Yeah, plagues happen. Um I guess we should uh, start taking some more questions from the audience, looking mm -hmm. at the time. Um, all right, here's a fun one for Arkady. We'll put you on the spot. <laughs> Actually, it, it, it segues nicely into uh, struggles with writing our books. Um, was it intimidating writing the second book, having won the Hugo Award for the first book, or were you already far enough along that it didn't matter in your process? So publishing is completely divorced from the actual progression of time. <laughs> so I had written and handed in and done copy edits on book two before the Hugo ever happened. Mm -hmm. um, what did freak me out a little bit was after A Memory Called Empire won the Hugo, I got a lot more attention, I guess, which is logical and also vaguely terrifying. Um, and so there was a lot more people waiting for the second book than there than I had imagined that there would be. And a lot of those people were not necessarily, like I, I had a good audience for the first book, like that, which is wonderful. And they were sort of the people who I thought would love it, you know? Like people who like complicated, ethically complex sci-fi. And then there were all of these other people who were reading it because it had won the Hugo. And all of them are like, well, will she do better or worse? I don't want to no, no. So that was hard. But it, it's it's like, I mean, it's the kind of problem you want to have. So I feel not that bad about it, but um, I don't know. It. I don't know if I'm intimidated by like the, I won a prize and now I have to be as good as much as the, there is a much bigger audience up there. Let me ask a follow-up question. Um, and that is the book that you're working on now do you have any qualms, both in terms of shifting to a different subgenre? It sounds like, um, you know, and or like feeling any pressure because of the expectations after these first two. I definitely hope that the people who love Texcalon will come with me into Prescribed Burn um, because it's. I'm really pleased with what it's gonna be like. Um, and it's also, every novel is hard. Um, and, and I like doing different things and doing sort of near medium future cyberpunk e climate fiction is something I really wanted to do. And I hope that the people who love what I'm doing now will take a chance on a very different subgenre, but a lot of the same ideas. Um, cause I mean, I'm still me, <laughs> so, um, but again, it's not the Hugo so much as the, I'm shifting subgenres and it's a pretty big shift. Mm -hmm. Like it's a very different kind of book. It's also a, a it's a noir in a lot of ways. So Ooh. I'm taking a lot from Chandler and, uh, Gibson, so. Awesome. Different. Um, so a lot of votes asking us to talk about the genesis of our book covers. <laughs> so maybe pick one of your book covers. 
uh, preemie and <laughs> um, I'll go first since I'm making all of you, I've been making all of you go first until now. Uh, so Machine Head, so this is the lovely cover. I have a fun story, which is I was searching for cover inspirations and I, I think I Googled Robot Buddha and I came across this amazing sculptor slash mechanical artist in South Korea, who is a uh, Wang Ziwon. And they had these mechanical Buddha statues that actually like move. There's like gears. This is one of the simpler ones, but on their website, they have just an amazing assortment of these like cyberpunk looking Buddhas. And um, and I sent that over to my editor who also loved it. We figured it fit nicely with the book. And then the cover design people came up with, you know, all the other like cool stuff, the circuits, the halo and, and everything else. And initially we were going with black and white and then I really like the color blue. Maybe you can tell <laughs> from all the blue behind me. Um, so even though I'm not wearing blue today, uh, so I was like, can we, can we throw like a, just a hint of blue in there? And they were good with that. So that's, that's my cover Genesis story. Uh, who wants to go next? I'll go. I, uh, Hi. I love my cover. I love it so, so, so much. Um, so I, my cover artist and cover designer, the artist is Tommy Arnold um, of Gideon the Ninth and Harrow the Ninth fame. Um, and the designer is Lauren Panapinto at Orbit. And when they told me to come up with some ideas because Tommy was going to be my artist, I like, I think I screamed, I definitely screamed. Um, maybe hyperventilated a little, fan myself. Um, <laughs> but the sort of like the artist direction that me and my editor were kind of going with, she's like, I'm envisioning, like we take traditional fantasy book, like, man on throne or man standing with gun or whatever and we just keep that same entire vibe but we make it a woman and i was like yes that's what i want um and then boom that's like i didn't i gave like just a general like physical description i said that i mean the most important one was that she's black and she's got she's hot but not hot but like hot to other women other women think she's hot like th that was those were the key um things um and um he delivered quite obviously like i i saw the sketch and i was in love and then i saw the finished one and i was in love and um i'm excited for some of the possibilities we've been batting around for book two but uh that's all i'll say about that <laughs> Premi, you want to go next? Which book cover are you going to talk about? Oh, um, I guess I have to talk about both of them, but I'll start with the first one briefly. So this is the uh, first one, just kind of this uh, very tentacly grabby looking ring. And um, it was about six months before I realized there are faces on the ring that in silhouette. And I screamed and I dropped the book um, <laughs> because I hadn't noticed them before. So it was like they kind of suddenly appeared. Um, I didn't really I did not know that. I yeah, have to go back and look at the cover now. Like, neither did I. Yeah. I almost had a panic attack. It, <laughs> um, I, I didn't give, uh, I wasn't really given the chance to have any input into uh, the cover design, although I ended up loving it. Uh, the cover designer is James Paul Jones. And um, yeah, so it, uh, this, this was the first one. I didn't know what it looked like until somebody pinged me on Twitter and was like, hey, your book's up for pre-order on Amazon. I'm like, is it? <gasps> Does it have a cover? So I went and looked at the cover. <laughs> and uh, then for the second one, it's two rings. So that's basically the genesis of mine. Although I will say um, the first one, actually the having it be like this and having the things coming shooting off it is also, um, which I didn't realize to lead here either, actually really clever because it points to a major, major event that happens in the novel, specifically how the two characters, the two main characters first meet. And it took me also quite a while to realize that and also wonder if James had done it on purpose. I'm not sure. But I really, really, um, I love them. I think they're really striking. Like they just kind of jump out at me every time I look at yeah. them, which is good because they're scattered all over my house. 
<laughs> uh, Arkady, is there more I got to the story? A little bit. Um, so I didn't have much input into the like actual specifics of the covers. Um, my editor basically floated some really general ideas. Like we want it to look like maybe a, a still from a Star Wars movie. Um, like that kind of combination of like space opera, but also a little bit on the epic fantasy side uh, to kind of get the feel of the books. And I was really enthusiastic about that. And then um, Jamie Jones came back with the cover of Memory and I basically fell on the floor because it was like he had a window into my head. Um, and I had not talked to him. All he had was like the book. We had never, we still haven't spoken. <laughs> we still have some input into my head. Um, and the only thing that I, only input that I had directly was I made a very impassioned case that the text should be gold, not silver. Um, and I had to argue a little bit with marketing on that one because apparently silver is for sci-fi and gold is for fantasy and never the twain shall meet. Um, but I'm glad I argued because I think I was right on this <laughs> one. <laughs> so good, it's so good. Yeah, it needs to be gold given the, the it does. Yeah, it absolutely it does. does. The, the, yeah, so yeah. Um, mostly I've been very <laughs> The thing that's so cool about the the Texacon books is that they, like, they're, they're setting pieces that just make it feel so huge. And I just feel like I'm being eaten by an empire, like this huge, especially with Desolation, because there's this teeny tiny little person in this huge mm -hmm. ship, and it's just so good. It's just... I'm going to jump down the question queue, because I want to know the answer to this question. Um, have there been any reactions to your books that have surprised you? Good or bad, you know? Yes. <laughs> but so I've had some surprises, but they're mostly in a sort of, um, I did not, it's something that I can't always see when I'm writing. Like one, there's been comments about like, oh, you know, pacing or whatever. But the some, the biggest surprise, um, so someone recently did a poll because like I knew that one of the primary characters is going to be very polarizing um, or not necessarily polarizing, but I knew that she was going to create strong feelings. And so that's Luca, the princess. Um, and she's a point of view character and in my head, I know what I was writing her as. Well, <laughs> um, someone did a poll recently that was like, would you like to, how do you feel about Luca? Would you like to hug her or like say, fuck you, Luca? Um, and I was really surprised that the overwhelming majority was hug Luca. I was like, really? Y'all want to hug her? Like... <laughs> I mean, okay, like obviously I love her, like I wrote her, so I care deeply about her. I think she's very misguided, <laughs> but I was, so yeah, I was really surprised by that. I mean, like, please guys, don't stop, don't stop loving her, I need you, but it's just a very polarizing, like people either like hate her, like despise her or love her. And I did not expect like such a wide, range of uh, opinions. I mean, I'm happy about it. I'm not. Yeah. Uh, I guess for me, uh, I've been most surprised and I hope that there's someone watching this who knows what I'm talking about. Um, there's a character in uh, the first uh, Beneath the Rising book that uh, has about like five paragraphs of on page time and uh, something tragic befalls this character. And the number of people since then who have come crying into my DMs or have <laughs> tweeted at me or probably shown up at my house holding a boom box and I haven't noticed them because there's a plague. Um, it, at this point is in the hundreds because <laughs> people got very, very, very attached to this particular character and, are, and I am a monster for what happens Obviously, to it. Yes. And obviously I'm a yeah, obviously I'm the monster. And 
if I were to gather up all the um, extremely sad social media messages I've gotten, it would be longer than the book. <laughs> <laughs> I am extremely surprised by that. I did not expect that at all. <laughs> Arkady, any surprising reactions? Um, I don't know, the weirdest one, and this is not really a spoiler in Desolation, there is one fairly graphic sex scene. People have been incredibly surprised that there's a graphic sex scene. And I'm like, why are you surprised, guys? It's Didn't you want this to happen? All of my social media messages from the last book were fairly clear on this being an ideal outcome. Um, you are now weirded out that I decided how they did the thing. Uh, okay, sure, but I don't know why. Maybe because book one didn't feature graphic sex. It was so they there weren't. was no sex. well, it, no one had any in book one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I will say it did take me by surprise. Not like. It didn't take me by surprise because as I was reading, I like it, it was a clear trajectory. Like there was an emotional thing happening between these two characters. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to be mad if they bone, but I don't know if they're going to bone like on the page like that. Um, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I think part of it's just like genre expectations. Like, I don't know mm -hmm. if I've ever read any, like I would love recommendations y'all like, please. But I don't know if I've ever actually read it on the page like that. And obviously like, you know, between two women, which is like extra bonus, but. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's actually kind of why I did go as far as I did in the graphicness of that one, is yeah. that I never get to see that in the the genre of books that I love, even, yeah. even when there are queer relationships in them, they are almost always very fade to black. Yeah. And a lot of queer people have, sex that goes farther than that. Some <laughs> do not, but many do. And I, it felt like I'd be doing a disservice to the characters if I didn't follow the emotional arc to the like point where the emotional arc was over, even if the actual banging was not. <laughs> I, I was sure you were going to drop the word climax in there. Come on. <laughs> I was working very hard not to. <laughs> We're all waiting for it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't have uh, any in the, okay, well, <laughs> I'm not surprised at people's reactions to the utter lack of privacy in 2095. I was, I was, I was definitely expecting people to be weirded out by that. And I partly did that on purpose to, to provoke that. Um, so, so in Machine Hood, just for context, there are these swarms of tiny drone cameras, like everywhere all the time, you're always on camera, you get tips for like, pretty much anything you do in your life, including what you choose to wear that day, have sex, cook, you know, all of that. That was really me pushing the envelope of, of social media taken, you know, to a particular extreme. I figured that would, that would bother people. The thing that has surprised me um, in a good way is the, the number of people that have been intrigued by the Machine Hoods Manifesto, which never makes a complete appearance in the book. It's mostly in like the chapter epigraphs, like the little text that comes at the start of chapters. And I have been told that a lot of people don't even read those so that they, you know, they shouldn't be an integral part of the story, right? It should be a bonus content. So I made sure that, you know, I never put anything like plot critical in the chapter epigraphs. And I wrote this whole manifesto and I've excerpted it completely out of order, right? I just pulled like, little pieces, you know, that I thought were relevant to that chapter. But in spite of that, apparently people have been writing re or reading the, um, the chapter epigraphs because that seems to be like the thing that has intrigued a lot of um, the fans of this book who are just like, there was one person who actually took notes and tried to reconstruct it and was like, 
there's sections missing. I was like, okay, I'll post the whole thing <laughs> online for someone who wants to go read it. I was like, that's that's a lot of effort you went to <laughs> assembling 30 different chunks of this document. But I, I'm very gratified that uh, that people are enjoying that aspect of the book. I just wasn't expecting that to be the thing people honed in on. So um, yeah, I think we are we are at time. Though there are many many more wonderful questions, we'd probably be here for another hour answering them. I I wanted to say I appreciate the audience for for asking them and for being so engaged with us. I know I hate that we're at time because it's such it's just so much fun to listen to all of you talk and. When I do get to ask a question, I always like to end events on a fun question. So is it okay if I just ask you one of the fun questions that you guys didn't get to? Sure. And okay, it's like, this is a question I asked, so I'm calling myself out for asking my own question, but whatever. Um, but I always think it's fun to ask, um, if you had one day to spend in the world that you have created, what would you do? Or what would you go see? And there is the caveat that I now must add that you like will not die or suffer some like horrendous <laughs> misfortune or torture because that is very plausible for all of the world. <laughs> that you guys have. But um, but I always because there it could be go and visit the most amazing garden that will never exist in our world or literally whatever you would want to do or see. Oh, as soon as you said the amazing garden, now I know what I would visit. I had I had a different answer, which was a rocket launch because I really want to go to space, but cool. that's not unique to my book. Um, I will I will let everyone else think and jump in because you said garden. I have, um, and this is in the early chapters and not very critical, so I'm happy to spoil this particular thing, but there is a convention center that's basically built out of genetically engineered trees using like solar powered glass. There's robot insects and natural butterflies that go maintain the outside and inside it's all basically like soil and turf and plants. So it's this very sort of organic, um, natural space and uh, and it's in it's it's in Chennai and Bangalore and Singapore that first started building these partly as as tourist attractions and to draw people to come have conventions in and conferences in those parts of the world and I would absolutely die to see that even if I did have to die I'm like somebody <laughs> build it I want to go <laughs> I want to go experience that like someone gets inspired to actually build one of those if that would be amazing that sounds amazing. I'm like, oh, we have Comic Con in San Diego, and our convention center could use like some sprucing up. This sounds like, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, don't make me call. Who a... <laughs> <laughs> um, creepy. I'm just going down the line. Oh, yeah, no, I, I was thinking too. I'm like, okay, so if we if we can't get into serious trouble, um, I guess, if and if we're talking about most recent book, then uh, A Broken Darkness is set on Earth. So I was thinking, well, um, I don't know. The, the first chunk of it is set in uh, Edinburgh, which is a city that I really like and um, have gone to a couple of times, not for the purposes of doing book research, but just because I think it's cool. And um, yeah, maybe... Uh, maybe the party uh, in Edinburgh Castle at the start of the book. I might, I might go visit there and get some hors d'oeuvres and uh, walk around looking at the cool old buildings. Get to hug another human being. Get to hug another human being, <laughs> which I have not done for like a year and a bit. I don't know. Well, sad. Yeah. Soon, I hope. Um, yeah, so I, I know where I would like to go. I would like to go to, um, if you've read The Unbroken, you've heard mention of the first library, the Scorpion Library. It's in the Cursed City, and um, it's sort of inspired by like the idea of um, the Alexandrian Library. And I called it the Scorpion Library because I read a poem 
by Bridget Peak and Kelly called Escandaria, um, yep. which is Alexandria. And um, it talks about like, like scorpion bodies and how their like inside body, it looks like book pages. And um, so Luca wants to go there. It's very protected knowledge um, about magic and stuff. Um, and so I would like to go there and see what's, it's, it would be like going to the Alexandrian library for me, except in that world. So it'd be pretty cool. That sounds beyond amazing. I mean, all of these sound amazing. <laughs> I think I'd actually, I do a lot in, more in, um, in A Memory Called Empire than in A Desolation Called Peace, but I've written a lot about Tixcalunli food. Um, and it's kind of a combination of my favorite real life cuisines, a very odd combination when I think about it, because there's a bunch of sort of Turkish, Ottoman, Central Asian things with the whole bunch of Central American ingredients. Um, so some of what they have does not exist. Like they, they wrap a lot of things in flowers, which are definitely bigger than flowers that we have. And I want to eat the things that I've made up. So I probably just spend a lot of time in restaurants, uh, like wander around the jewel of the world like with one of those ridiculous tourist guidebooks that I put in the epigrams <laughs> um, and be like, okay, and now I will go and eat this. <laughs> that also sounds so, I'm like hungry now. I'm like, it's getting close <laughs> to dinner and I'm like, now I am going to look at my measly meal and be like, where's the giant flower <laughs> and delicious delicacies that I now want? <laughs> But thank you guys for answering that one. I always like to hear it because since you live in the world so much, it's fun because it lets us see a little part sometimes that we don't always get to in the books because there's so much of the worlds in your heads that we don't always get to see. But um, it is that time. I cannot detain you any longer, but I can give a huge, huge thank you so much to all of you for joining us and to all of our amazing readers and attendees, all of the awesome questions. As always, thank you guys so much for all of the love in the comments for these authors. Um, it is very, very well deserved. And just thank you guys so much. This is, I mean, I'm slightly biased because I love books, but this is like the best way to start a weekend. So thank you all so much. Have a lovely, amazing weekend. And if you would like to purchase any of these books, support these authors, I would highly, highly recommend all of their works. There will be, well, there currently is a purchase books button down below and you can purchase any of their books as well as get book plates. So just once again, thank you so very much. And thank you for bringing such amazingness into the worlds that you've built for the diversity, the sex, I mean, <laughs> shout out. Um, um, also, like the ethics and just all of the great things that you guys touch within your books as well, which is just amazing as well. So thank you guys so very much. I will stop gushing about how awesome you all are. And we will say good night, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are in the world. And we will see you all next time. Goodbye, guys. Bye. Thank, thank you guys bye. so much.